the last piece that I want to show you is that we're going to put together a program that just adds it to a checklist, right? And the main reason, because we're avoiding this. So when I say that our firemen have gotten hurt on these things, this is what happened. This is what happened in 75 to change Boston. There's a very famous photograph that uh, won a Pulitzer Prize on the back side of that. And so that's the fourth story of a building. The fire, the fire truck ladder is coming over to grab those two people and then at the last second, the fireman grabs the ladder, the woman falls to her death, the niece lands on her and survives. Okay, so it's usually some catastrophe that all of a sudden, and they changed the law because the law then was fix it when it's, only when it's broke. But back then in 75, they changed the law in Massachusetts to have mandatory inspections of your fire escapes every five years because something happened. But like anything else, people very quickly forget about a death. A few years later, and we'll show you that, okay? So you want to go to some of these cities. Uh, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts has is one of our premier cities that is a model city. So you want to speak with, so if you want to speak nationwide, there's always some city that has taken on this model and a lot of times it's to get ahead of the curve of people getting hurt. So if anybody ever asks us why you why are you bothering me with the fire escapes, you say, because the first one we're trying to save is the firemen fighting the fire. The second ones we're trying to save is the tenants in the building who are supposed to evacuate the fire by themselves. Okay, fire escapes are made for so people can self-evacuate, firemen can use it to ingress, and then farming can use it to egress when things get crazy. But should the fire escape fail, none of that's gonna happen. All right, so now let's rapid fire ourselves through this. So when you get to, if you wanna make a note, when you get to find it on, on, on Google, just type in fire escape issues. And all of Oregon, it's all on their, on their website, how to fix it, how to repair it, how to scrape it, how to load test it, everything's there. Here's the confidence test. This confidence test, which we'll do at the end of the class, has 25 specific questions that every engineer and every architect hates because it says yes, no, not an opinion. Did you walk the fire escape? Yes, no. Did you see that every connection, that did it have internal rust or not? This internalization question of the rust is key because a lot of times they want to drive, they want to do a drive-by, roll down the window, grab the check, look up at the fire escape, say it's not on my head, sign the certificate, send it to you, you take that document, you stick it in a file, and then what happens? For 50 to 75 years, that's been the norm. But as soon as you have a dead fireman or a dead person on the ground, what happens? You can't take that, pot, that piece of paper out of the file and revive that dead fireman, that dead person. But the lawsuits are gonna stop flying, and a lot of it is, what have you been doing? So nationwide, so always after a catastrophe, does somebody start suing the city, start involving the city, what were you doing, and the news, news hounds start coming down and coming down, you're not doing your job, you're not doing your job. Everybody's budgets here have been cut, and this and so you cannot start another task force, but what I'm telling you, you're gonna, you're gonna make a, you're gonna make a, ch a simple checklist. This is just gonna be added onto a checklist. You can't go from A to C without going through B, and B is the asking of a current certificate. Not ordering one, asking for one. Not having one, you're still gonna go to C, but now you're gonna make a note and refer <laughs> back to fire prevention to say write a violation, because right now you... Uh... So here's the code, here's the 25 questions. You can. If you, uh, you're welcome to use it, it's not copywritten. I mean, we, this is our latest, greatest. And uh, so you can either write these questions out on your own letterhead if you want. You can use our letterhead, I mean, not our letterhead. You can use our questionnaire if you want. Uh, it has all the codes here. So in case people want to reference, we've referenced the IBC, the IFC, the technical, the OSHA, the NFPA, it's all here. Frequently asked questions, okay? On here is you tell us how what you want to, to tell the people. So if there's certain specific requirements you have, we put that on there for you. And this is the last page. This is a vendor that we want to find out if the vendor is properly licensed and insured. This will eliminate a lot of the witch doctors who have been fixing the fire escape. Okay, you guys remember now. I want to show you a little bit of history. So, 1975. You guys remember the Station Night Fire that happened in Rhode Island? So. 2003, thereabouts, right? So 1975 to 2000, uh, 
to 2005, let's say, just to give it rough numbers, 30 years. 30 years later, there's a fire down in Rhode Island, so Channel 7 is calling around and they find me. Not because I had, I didn't even have the National Fire Escape Association then at the time. I'm the founder. But she said, hey, I want to ask you about fire escapes. I told her that over 75% of the fire escapes that look like fail. Over 50% of those have life safety concerns. She goes, no way, we have code, we have laws. So she was calling me about the station night fire, but she wanted to do a fire escape, um, you know, story, a one minute piece on, you know, how people can get out on fire escapes. And this is what came of it. The smoke, the flames, and the frightened faces. All in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night. It wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Oh, I was scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escape that broke underneath him. Where the railing just came away from the building. And our investigation found across Massachusetts, more unsafe fire escapes. Rusty, deteriorating, crumbling, broken. And what state officials didn't know, the system they set up to keep fire escapes safe is also falling apart. The potential ramifications are disastrous. So let's look at this one. This expert iron worker is licensed to build, maintain, and inspect fire escapes. So that over here? For months, we examined dozens of them with alarming results. Looking at this today, would this pass inspection? No. In dormitories, at theaters, at homes, and apartment buildings. Rust is actually eating away the metal of the right. fire escape. Right. And the bottom line? It'll get weak and then eventually will fall. This one has rotted connections. This one, missing molds, twisted metal. Would the stairs come down? No, never come down. This one, a broken tread. So how dangerous is it for the people inside this building? This fire escape is definitely going to put somebody either in the hospital or it's going to put somebody at a... The cemetery. Fire escapes are so critical. The state building code requires they be certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years. But our investigation found that safeguard is simply being ignored. Here's proof. We chose fire escapes at random in Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Worcester, and here in Quincy. We checked building department files, but there's no fire escape certification. To see if building owners had Oops. submitted their mandatory inspection report. There's no certification in the perimeter. Bottom line, not one we checked in Quincy had been certified as safe. And the director of inspectional services admitted because of staffing shortages, the city has no idea how many other fire escape owners are breaking the rules. And as a result, do you know how many fire escapes in your city are safe or not? Well, I they know. Know. In Worcester, not one we checked was certified. In Somerville, no. four more fire escapes. To the fault of the cracks. Yeah. Not one up-to-date certification. And again, no system for keeping track. Uh, How can they get away? I guess that the shortest answer of all is because we don't have the resources to sit here and follow up on these things. If structural deficiencies are reported, local building inspectors can actually evacuate residents until repairs are made. Would you talk to us on camera about this? No. But when we surveyed two dozen more communities, most admitted they had no idea how many fire escapes were certified. In Taunton, inspectors told us they haven't seen a certification in 25 years. Northampton officials said, it's a cold day in hell when that happens. <laughs> in Cambridge, too, not one of our test buildings was certified, and the official in charge would not come out to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> there were more than 8,000 fire it. escapes. Again, no according to inspectional services, not one we check was certified. Officials know they are required to enforce the building code, but they admit they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation. You don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and, and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, hmm. you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan. So? An immediate bulletin's gonna go out, more paper showing up at your door, and what happens? 
Ten years later, this happened. Possibly have already lost, acknowledging that lax enforcement by the city could have contributed to the Back Bay fire that claimed the lives of two firefighters. Welders working next door may have been working on the building fire escape when they sparked the deadly fire. Fox Undercover revealed Wednesday that fire escape hadn't been inspected in 10 years, even though inspections are required every five years. Investigative reporter Mike Baudet digging up some new exclusive information tonight. Mike? We looked at the entire Beacon Street block where the fatal fire happened and discovered, just like 296 Beacon Street, most of the fire escapes there are overdue for inspections. It turns out the city doesn't have any mechanism in place to track building owners mechanism. violating the rules and hold them accountable. System. Mayor Walsh is not happy. Are you concerned that inspection wasn't done since 2004? Of course I am. And it's something that, you know, constantly every day it seems like something new is coming up around special services and we are looking at revamping a lot of a lot of the procedures in there. Boston Mayor Marty Walsh talking about 296 Beacon Street, a place where welders may have been working on the fire escape and they sparked the inferno at 298 Beacon Street, a fire that killed Boston Fire Lieutenant Ed Walsh and firefighter Michael Kennedy. Records reveal that fire escape had not been inspected since 2004, even though state building code requires inspections every five years. So the fire escape should have been inspected in 2009 and then again this year, which raises a troubling question according to fire code expert Amy Cronin, president of Strategic Code Solutions. We have to question if it, were, if it had been done in 2009, perhaps there may have been some damage there. Uh, like if you think about rust, if you catch it early enough before there's massive damage and there needs to be reconstruction, maybe the welding would have never been done. Two of our heroes lost their life in that fire. Uh, and I'm not sure if that was the cause, but regardless whether that was the cause or not, we still should have inspected that property. It turns out many inspections are not being done. Fox Undercover looked at fire escape inspection records for the entire Beacon Street block where the deadly fire happened. Two thirds of those fire escapes are overdue to be inspected. A third of the fire escapes on the block haven't been inspected in 10 or more years. It's the responsibility of property owners to get the inspections done. But there's no evidence of the city cracking down on owners breaking the rules. Shouldn't the city know if an inspection hasn't been done in all those years? Absolutely, it should. And, and there, should be, there should be a report generated that's able to find out what, what properties haven't been inspected. So if that's one of the properties that haven't been inspected on, what, on Beacon Street, can you just imagine the other pro properties in the city of Boston? That concerns me. Back to 296 Beacon Street, where the welders who sparked the fire were working. We told you the last inspection on the fire escape was done in 2004. As we reported Wednesday, that inspection was done by Giuseppe Falcone, who owned D&J Ironworks in Malden. Falcone is being sued by the owner of the building that burned down, but he denies having anything to do with the welding that day. No comment from the owner of 296 Beacon Street, which did not have the fire escape inspected for a decade. I'm Mike Bodette for Fox Undercover. So... This is, she did the story with me in 2003, 2014, 10 years they just let it go again. So it's always an accident, forget about it, because the mechanism, let's answer some of the questions that are concerned. How do we know what fire escapes have been inspected or not without having to go back to the city to pull a file? You have a tag on it, what happens? The tag tells you, just like an elevator tag that nobody puts in elevators anymore, where is it now? It's in the manager's office. Where was it before? So right there and so you would call the city and say listen I'm, I'm riding an elevator and it's like it's th been three years since they since they inspected it so they started taking the tags out of the elevators and putting it in the manager's office why so, so in case they miss their tags so this is why you need to have a tag on a fire escape and it's part of your fire prevention code check your code even way before we came up with this as an idea it's already all fire equipment needs to be tagged is that correct it's part of your code fire escapes are fire protection there's supposed to be a tag on it. So if you put a tag on it, it's gonna have the date of the last inspection clearly visible from seven to 10 feet off the ground. It's a tag that's this big, it's eight and a half by 11. So if it has a white tag, you can look up and see. So any normal inspection routines that you go through, when your firemen are doing pre-plans, they can see what ones are tagged out, okay? So that's the thing. And the mechanism right now is make it part of a checklist because they were wondering why there wasn't a team to go look at these things. There's no team. Make it part of a checklist. You pull a permit, you have to have a fire escape affidavit. You do a re-rent, you have to have a fire escape affidavit. You're basically, you're declaring the building safe again so it can be re-rented. You sold the building, you gotta go through the whole process. Okay? So, 
A lot, a lot of times it's a catastrophe, and a catastrophe, it happened in 75, that changed the code. So it can quickly get out if you don't make it an automatic. So in 75, they didn't make it an automatic. <coughs> 30 years later, something happened. So usually this has to happen, or one of the, or one of the firefighters have to happen. And it's happened all the time in Boston. They've had both. So here's what your firefighters are, are facing. They're getting to a building, and they're looking at this. They're like, oh, there's a rusty fire escape there. I got to get up one story, or I got to get up five stories, or I got to get up ten stories, right? And the fire escape, by the time a fire escape gets this rusty, does anybody know how fire escapes <coughs> rust? Do they rust from the outside in or the inside out? Does anybody know? The inside out. By the time it gets this brown on a fire escape, it has eaten every connection, the suspect. How much so? When you start looking underneath, because when you look at it from afar, it doesn't look so bad. But when you get underneath, and by the way, this is a detention center, a youth detention center, with with uh, not only prisoners but also fire uh, um, guards that have to use this every day to get in and out into a little open yard. This is how bad it was underneath. There's another one at a school. It takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch of rust. It takes 50 years to grow an average of half inch of rust. Look how much rust on this. And so what the firemen are facing nowadays is this issue. That there's rust that they can't see and if people are smart, they'll paint it way before you get it inspected and they'll paint right over this rust. And you know what happens? When, when the uh, firemen arrive at a site, whether it's in the dark, whether it's in smoke, they don't have time to carry around a two and a half pound hammer and do this. So the last thing they issue you a fireman is a ping hammer to go ping ponging up the fire escape. What I'll do now is I have my but if you look at this, we're inspecting the fire escape and hammer testing. And if you start looking at some of these, look at all the look at all the treads ready to trap or kill a fireman or a tenant. So this is why there's an order issued, it's verbal. It's not written anywhere that the fire departments have issued. They say all firemen, in case of fire. Don't use the fire escape unless it's your last hope. Don't save women and children and babies using the fire escape because you could kill yourself trying. You can you can kill yourself on the way out too. Let's talk to you a little bit about the welding witch doctors. I pulled this fire escape off of a school. Guess who called me to fix this fire escape? Was it the yearly fire exam or fire inspection? Was it the yearly building inspection? Was it the, the principal or the director of the school? Was it the janitor who said, hey dude, Probably the janitor. I got a window here at Christmas time. I need you to take this thing out. So this is for a kindergarten to eighth grade. They use this fire escape every day to go out to the kindergarten yard. And this is what, this is what I pulled. So now what I did with this when I have it back in Boston, I, I actually was four feet wide. And I actually saved the fire escape because it was embedded into the ground and I used it as a showpiece. And I shrunk it so I can carry it. So I shrunk a four footer down to two. At the same time, I actually violated everything that you could violate because I have a master's degree in reverse stupidity. Not only do I know the right way to fix things now, but I know all the wrong ways to fix it from back then. And my job is to tell you why it's wrong. So welding of the fire escape, this is what guys do. The, we call them the welding witch doctors. As soon as you hear a welding machine on a fire escape, it's being done wrong. It's that, maybe that day you're not gonna get hurt, but very soon in the next one to three years, somebody's gonna fall off that fire escape. Because they usually weld all the rust. Look at all, look how bad that, uh, that hole is and buried in the ground. A lot of times if you can't put stuff underneath it, what they do is they put a clip on top of it and they weld it to the individual bars. And you think these are all certified welders with their certs right there to show you? These guys don't weld, they melt rods on steel. Okay? This is the, you know, welding shops, when you talk, not a welding outfit, we're talking about ornamental shops all the time. The guys who are there are self taught how to weld. Look, look at all the orange paint on that. Orange paint on anything is an indication of what kind of paint? Lead paint. The EPA in 2010 says you can't burn anything that has lead paint, so you can't weld fire escapes anymore. Look at underneath. This is typical. When you find this much rust, what do you do? Just weld the nose. 
You got the original square head bolts, you got rust inside the connection, who cares? Well, the nose. This is why firemen don't get on fire escapes. This is why fire escapes continue. So the correct repair, which takes a lot of time, so you have the magic threes when you do the, you know, get a bid. 3,000, 13,000, 33,000. Just using those as relative numbers. But you can understand what's been fixing fire escapes for 50 to 75 years plus has been the $3,000 guys. The $13,000 guys don't even get a chance to shoot at it because the difference between 3,000 and 13,000, which is a better repair, you know what I'm saying? It's not even there because the, the welding guys beat them out. And because there's no mechanism there to verify that the weld was done correct, I mean that the repair was done correctly, what happens is as soon as you put enough paint on it, you're never gonna see any of this stuff. So the $3,000 guys have been getting away with repairing fire escapes for 50 to 75 years. That's why people are falling, okay? And causing fires and killing in Boston in 2014, two firemen. The winds were blowing at 60 miles an hour that day. And by the way, the fire escape, the building that caught fire was not the fire escape building. It was the one right next to it. They were welding on this building. That building, the, the welding spark landed on a shed. The shed caught on fire, and if you see the wind that day, the wind blew a hole into the ground floor. And as they were knocking on doors, they died in, they died in the first floor because they were knocking on doors getting people out, but when they blew out the windows in the front, the draft basically pulled the fire right in there. So I took the fire escape and I shrunk it. Look at all the lead paint. By the way, this is how all the little kids were using this every day. So if your kid had lead paint poisoning, where do you think it was coming from? School. School. And they tested the house and they tested around the yards, and well, where was the kid getting it? So this is so we made it a showpiece. We did it. We did a, a left and a right. The left side was totally done wrong. The right side was rebolted and done correctly. So this is where it was at the school. Every day they come out of there, and now we made it and we, we came over to the, to the side because they were able to run around underneath it and bang their heads on the on all the pieces of steel sticking out. All right, let's talk about live load testing. This is why firemen don't use it. Let me tell you the people that are getting hurt on these things. Uh, one of our guys, his dad died, uh, fell seven stories to his death in Chicago, fixing, fixing the fire escape. So these things not only kill firemen and tenants, they kill people like myself who touch these fire escapes because they're a deck of cards. You know what I'm saying? You don't know which one, but you have to have, there's a, it's a risky business. People are using fire escapes for all kinds of things. And with no smoking policies, what do you think most students smoke? taking down the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them, they said that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in their fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. Our firefighters say there's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson, on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8. I got called to this fire escape six months later. Witnesses say it sounded like an fixed. incredible explosion when the fire escape Philadelphia. of the Philadelphia apartment building suddenly collapsed and injured three people. NBC 10 cameras were there as a friend holds on to one of the victim's hands who is apparently conscious as the victim is placed into an ambulance by medics. KYW TV reports a man who was critically injured and two women were rushed to local hospitals. Police believe the bolts of the fire escape appear to have been rusted and dislodged from the brick wall of the apartment building. The victims fell more than 30 feet to the ground, and now the incident is under investigation. Worth noting, the complex is more than 100 years old, and even on Philadelphia's historic registry. Local reporters are all pointing out the city's licenses and inspections department hasn't filed any violations in the past when it comes to the old building. So Sunday's collapse came without warning. Neighbors say the three victims, reportedly all in their 20s, may have been partying on the fire escape landing before the incident. For Newsy, I'm Melissa Paganorn. May have been partying. Is that the reason why they fell? 
Maybe. Any properly constructed and installed fire escape will it ever, will it ever fall? Can you put as many people as you want on it, including the landlord? Will it ever fall? If it's not been maintained, this is what happens. Now, I happen to be at the case. Uh, I happen to be in the area, but I, I wasn't called by to be an expert witness. Like the summary video over yes. here in Philadelphia. All right. Some of the preliminary information that I'm getting out of this is that this piece here, which this is the back, used to be up against the building. These two brackets here used to be going to that fourth, fifth floor up there where you now see the two blowouts, the blowout on the left and the blowout on the right. And it used to be attached there. And then this staircase, which is here, it went to that platform up there. And that platform up there also had a bracket which is now laying inside the floor below. So they either were going up to that upper floor so this is what happens when you get things that are 75 to 100 years old. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So when you start the examination process, all you're doing is trying to identify, like Cincinnati is doing right now. All 100-year-old buildings must be examined by July 1. All 75-year-old buildings by July of next year. All 100-year-old buildings by the year after. So if you want to get into a process, you need to start the process of saying, I need to have these inspected, but be ready for a three to five year program because it's not gonna happen overnight, you're gonna get overwhelmed. There's another fire escape collapse here where you know, there was a bunch of people on this fire escape because the roofer, the guy who fixed his own roof, at the end when he put the fire escape back on with his sons, he had a couple extra bolts in his, in his box. <laughs> what do you do with those? <laughs> so what happened is this, they're lucky they fell from here to one floor below, otherwise if they fell from here all the way to the ground, they would all been dead. There was five people under that mangled. So that's lawsuits. There's another one close a by here. A startling scene in downtown Colorado Springs Wednesday after a man falls to his death. I was just walking up the street to get to the bus stop and the cops were right there told me I couldn't come this way. Police say the victim and several others were working on the roof of this privately owned building when the man fell. He may have fallen um, a distance of anywhere from 15 to 20 feet is what's being investigated right now. Tragically, the man died on scene. It's believed he fell from the fire escape and not the roof or a window, although how it happened is still unknown. That's what's being investigated right now to determine the actual cause of the accident itself. Right now, police say the death is not criminal and is being... So what happened there was that OSHA actually called me on that. He actually was jumping on the cantilever, him and a couple of other guys, jumping on the cantilever because it wouldn't come down because they wanted to use it to bring all those stuff to the roof. And when the cable snapped because they went all the way to the end, the cable snapped, the whiplash of the cable caught him and he only dropped 10 to 12 feet. They don't want to mention on there, but. Nice. There's another case right here in Boston where a girl, uh, these are two five stories on the hill, so this five story is higher. So the fifth story on this one sees the roof of this one. There's a brand new deck on the roof, so the guy that had the roof that, you know, they share a lot of times uh, crossovers, um, partying on the deck, his girl, the phone rang, his girlfriend decided to go answer the phone and she's not used to it. And because it was missing its rail, she came in this way and she, five feet to the ground. This is in Iowa. I did a case where a guy removed the fire escape to fix the window, then he put the fire escape back. He owns a lot of property in the, in the university. And instead of putting the through bolts back in, he put lag bolts back in. As soon as they were watching the fireworks, three people fell to there. Uh, they didn't die, they all got injured. But what did they do? They took out the through bolts and put in the lag bolts. How do we know that? Because when they secured the scene, they kept the fire escape in a secure location which to them in Iowa meant they threw it in this field like leg eight blocks away. So this is us walking around a field with the fire escape pieces. And it's then that we found the missing, the, the smoking gun, we found the, the lag still in the steel. Can we, do you mind, gentlemen? Yeah, yeah, it's a bunch of lawyers talking about because they see money. Whenever they see the smoking gun, they start calculating how much money they're going to make on the lawsuit. <clears throat> they put it back with a through bolt and a leg to the ground. You need both or you just need one? You just need one. But they were so scared they put in both. This metal leg to the ground on top of the asphalt. Shingles are on a pressure treated sleepers. Right on the shingles. These legs over here that were never there before. On pressure treated sleepers are straight to the shingles with no lectures. So these kind of things happen. So let's find out who inspects fire escapes. 
You read the code. Design professionals. Who's that mean? Engineers. Architects can inspect fire escapes. But how? What, what? Some people believe you guys inspect fire escapes. So we get a lot of calls that say the building inspector was here. He said everything's fine. You need to come here and just give me a paper that says everything's fine like he said it was fine. Like, no. Building inspectors and fire officials do not examine anything. They ask you to get a third party to verify that it's in good order through a certification process. And fire escape inspectors, those very clear on the code. Fire escapes must be examined by uh, design professionals or others ex uh, acceptable to the building official. So let's talk about the code. You guys have the code, uh, some uh, some sheets that uh, Gabe pulled, pulled in for you. Gabe, you want to pop up here for a minute and uh, let's talk about the code. We're about to show you how all four codes all tie into each other, right? So prior to 2015, is everybody aware that in 2012, the International Fire Code took over fire escape examinations? So all fire escapes as of 2012 were going to be inspected every five years in the entire country. But if you hadn't adopted the International Fire Code by then, and you were in 2009, for example, as of 2012, so if you just adopted the 2015 in the state, is that a correct statement? Correct, we're all on 2015 now? For the most part, all North Texas, the major uh, North Texas cities have adopted. I work for the city of Dallas. I'm a fire protection engineer there. I sit over here. And um, I see this every day. I work with, I have in my office, an International Building Code and International Fire Code. So we get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of calls from a lot of contractors discussing if it's included, if it's not included. So my answer is always, it always varies with your cities. Whatever your city has officially adopted, that's what's going to take place. Here, if you, if you take a look at this one here, uh, it's, it's just a staple copy, significant changes to the 2012 International Fire Code. This is where it actually took place and it was probably mentioned in your cities at, at this time. So if you, there was obviously other items here in the fire code that got significant changes to it. And if you take a look at the last piece there, it has section 1104.16.5.1, which reads examination mentioned that this new paragraph establishes a five-year minimum inspection frequency. It's either by a, a registered design professional, architects, engineers, or um, for fire escape service and balconies on 16 buildings, or others acceptable by the city official. In this case, uh, we could have fire escape inspectors, like uh, I'm a fire inspector by the Texas TCFP, but I'm also a trained fire escape inspector by the National Fire Escape Association. And this was previously for me moving to Texas. So uh, I just put part been in a, a little passion for this. I thought it, it's really important. I've done tons of inspections all over the West Coast, from LA to San, from south of San Diego, closer to Mexico, all the way north to San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. I've done some inspections here before I was with the city. I did, did some uh, the Hotel Lawrence in Dallas. I also did some in Fort Worth area, Wasahachie as well. So for Exxon Mobil, right? For XMOA, it's the XTO building, energy building. They have both of them buildings. They're high-rise buildings, and they're currently working still with us because they're doing repairs on them, taking away the rust and all this other stuff. But this is all you need to know in terms of the code. And if you look, open the fire code, go to uh, section 11.0.4, and then you have that. Uh, I, I, I print out a copy here, and it's, like I said, section 11.0.4.16, which read Firescape Stairways. And then if you go down on it, it gives you uh, what do you need to know in 16 means of egress, dimensions, access to it, what kind of material and strength is allowed, and finally the examination portion. Just one page long, but it gives you a lot of insights of what must be done in terms of a fire escape in your city. Uh, and obviously, we just, Mr. Manessa has already touched upon who is qualified enough to do these kinds of inspections. So if you get an a, a inspection report by somebody that you have doubts, make sure you start asking let me see your credentials, let me see your licenses, and so on and so forth, just to make sure that they are doing a good job in terms of the uh, when, what must be done according to the fire code here. NFPA also includes some of the items that are good for reference, uh, but for the most part, um, all the information, you could, you, could, you could find it in the National Fire Escape Association or also Fire Escape Engineers, which is also part of the National Fire Escape Association. Uh, hold on just one second. I just want to bring a point that uh, Cincinnati, and again, you can copy people, or you can ask us which one has the best, or you can get measure, put them all different together. So uh, there's uh, 
Cincinnati, which is, you know, they didn't have any help from us. They just put this together and they started last October. They have a facade inspection every five years and they have a firescape facade, uh, firescape inspection. It's the same sheet. And they want everything to come out safe, safe with ordinary repairs, unsafe or unsafe with imminent hazard. It's the same sheet. So some of, these are some of the things we'll tell you. So they just use the facade inspection and just threw firescapes on top. It can get better, you know what I'm saying? We, we have, but it's, it's a good start because they have a three to five year plan for all these things. Okay, so what we want to talk about is that even though you have this code, there's a clear piece that you have to understand. Fire case is supposed to be load tested. And the load test is what everybody does want to do because it's very expensive. And we're going to show you load testing on here because it is something you can do. It is done, but we're not selling load tests. We're trying to tell you that on average, every fire escape is supposed to be retrofitted every 25 to 35 years, meaning the fasteners. You do that the same way they did the roofs, the windows, the electric, the plumbing in that building. They get swapped out and renewed every 25 to 35 years. Is that an average? Well, the fire escape fasteners are supposed to do that. You change those fasteners, there is no load test. So we're not pushing load testing. We're saying that's the card you have because you need to see it in the code. And if I may, on here, the code part talks about the examination. Uh, materials and strength. Uh, they shall be constructed to take 100 pounds per, for, uh, for, uh, per square foot, right? But then when you go down to the examination, it says, shall be examined for structural adequacy and safety in accordance with the section by registered design professional or others acceptable or as required by the fire code inspection and inspection reports will, shall then be submitted for the examination. They want uh, to, I think it's on the second page, they talk about the, um, the, uh, the low test portion of it that says that as part of your, you have to make, you sh it shall meet the low test requirements. So we're trying to tell you that the examination and the load test is in, is in two specific categories, but when it says it shall, ins it shall meet the load test, it's really telling you you're supposed to be load testing these 50, 75, five, sometimes 100 year old structures. We're trying to tell you that if you refurbish these fire escapes, there is no load test for the next 15 to 25 years because you're using other evidence of strength. And I'll use that as an example. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, you guys can always call because uh, he deals with this every day. What's your position there at uh, I'm at the, Dallas, you're in the fire protection engineer assistant here with the city of Dallas. Uh, we do hazmat, fire sprinklers, fire alarms. Right now, I'm doing hazmat and sprinklers as well. Um, here with the National Fire Escape Association, I'm the t chief technical, um, chief technological officer. So I get involved, spread message, give the information out. It's free. No, I'm not trying to charge anybody for my services, but. Uh, I tend to, you know, make other people aware. I'm already trying to push something there at the building department with the city of Dallas. Get in Mr. Uh, uh, David Session. He's assistant building official out there to start picking something now because we don't have anything at, at, as of this point. Uh, we are aware that we do have fire escapes in the city, so uh, we're at a point where, like, I'm asking, I'm, I'm letting know we don't want to have a tragedy here because we're going to start getting news coverage, and that's when the still. That's when everything gets brought up to attention, and then we start, you know, especially for him, he's assistant building official with Philip Sykes. He's a building official. You're going to have a lot of, you know, answering to do. So, so uh, this is what I want to say. He's in Dallas, and it's not, it hasn't popped in Dallas. I'm in Boston, and it hasn't popped in Boston. But Sid's outside of Boston. I am in Dallas, but Houston has popped. You know what I'm saying? So don't worry about where it's going to pop, because sometimes you could be in the city and nothing's going on because there's other ostriches with their heads in the sand. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And when those things happen, it's okay. I mean, it, sometimes you have to surround the castle. You know what I'm saying? And that's what, what sometimes has to happen. So be aware that it starts on a local level. We have, the answer is you have to have a system. But let me, ex let me make sure you understand how everybody's tied in together. The fire code said all fire cases must be examined every five years from now on anyway. So whether you agree or not, every five years, every building in the U.S. is getting their fire escape examined. And the insurance companies haven't started enforcing this, and when they do, they don't care about your code anymore. The International Fire Code tells you that the fire case must be uh, certified and must be load tested, right? Look at the uh, look at the uh, NFPA. They say it the best. The authority having jurisdiction. This is Life Safety Code 101. The authority having jurisdiction, which is either you or the building, shall be permitted to approve any existing fire case there that has been shown by load tests or other evidence of strength to have adequate strength. So what's that mean? They want you to load test it, or they have to show me other evidence of strength. You know what other evidence of strength is? A full refurb on a fire escape. So if you got a 50, 75, and 100 year old fire escape, and you refurb all the connectors outside, 
and you verify all the connections into it, I'll duplicate them with a new epoxy bolt or a new, a new uh, um, sandwich uh, through bolt plates, guess what? You've just met other evidence of strength. So we're not low testing, we're asking for you to try to reach as much as you can the other evidence of strength because it lasts for more years. So it puts off the low testing for the next 15 to 25 years. But if somebody is really giving you a hard time and they kind of did a welding witch doctor job on a fire escape, how can you assure that you're going to be good for another five years plus minus? What can you pull out of your pocket that says it in the NFBA, says shall be examined or tested, says it in your IFC, says it in the IBC? What can you pull out? The low test card. So whenever anybody's fighting with you about you know what they did to the fire escape, just pull out your low test card. Because you'll be supported by the International Fire Code, the International Building Code, testing and certification, and all exterior fire escape sh systems shall be examined or tested. 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 Everybody keeps saying the word test. So you're just around, and even OSHA's gonna get into this, okay? I'm gonna show you another car that you can pull out to close down a building if you have to, and stress, okay? So let me see if the OSHA code. Quick question on like an apartment complex with two or three floors and you, know, you have just the, the stairways going up to the top floors. It's not a technical fire escape, but it's their means of egress to get in and out of the building and stuff. Does that fall under this as well as having to be tested? International. All exterior fire escapes systems. All, systems. all exterior, it, it read better, used to say all exterior, mm -hmm. still wooden stairs, mm -hmm. balconies, bridges, fire escapes, areas of refuge. So the building department says if it's outside and not enclosed from the weather, guess what? It falls into this examination. Because people always do that whole fire escape thing. That's the tip of the iceberg. Below that, there's a lot more. Catwalks, you know, uh, staircases on the outside of tanks. Right. Uh, any, anything that somebody has to fight up to go fight a fire. Roof access ladders to the, to the elevator shafts and all this other stuff. Those are all things connected with bolts. All exterior, steel or wooden stairs. And if you look at that, fire escape is mentioned last, it's not mentioned first. Got it? And it's wood structures too, so you get the back of a building, it's an all wood structure. Does that have to be examined? All exterior steel or wooden stairs. So it's all there in the code. I just wanted to show you how the, all the codes are tied into each other. Technical assistance, this is what supports me for being in another. So I'm a licensed and certified fire escape inspector in two states, California and Massachusetts. But technically, in all my other states, I use the technical assistance. And what is that? If I'm a solar guy, forget fire escapes, I'm a solar guy and I'm going to inspect solar something. Well, there's not too many engineers that know anything about solar. How do you get an engineer to inspect something solar or windmills if they don't even, there's not many guys out there? This allows you to use this technical assistance to say that you are allowed to bring in a, a qualified engineer, a specialist, a laboratory or fire safety specialist organization to help the fire code official determine that something is good. So, um, and other. And by the way, at the same time, you can always have the other peer reviewed, so you have the right to have me have a, a structural engineer review my document. Anyway, it says that right at the end. So you can still have me be peer reviewed by somebody who knows less than me. It's all on technical, okay? This applies to any new technology that's currently out there, guys. I just made, this is where, I, this is my explanation of another. All right, let's talk about fire escapes. Opinion affidavits versus certifications. Opinion affidavits is what everybody's been doing when the welding witch doctors have come through, nothing's dangling, structural engineers have been signing off on these things. Would you sign off on this thing, the way it looks? Well, the structural engineer was ready to sign off on this when I got called it and he said, yeah, fix these four things and I'll sign off on it and then paint it. So this is an opinion affidavit. Any pictures? So. He says, fix these four things, I'll sign off on it. Let's say I sent you my report, and I condemned it, and all these reds are emergency repairs. That's the size of the structure. So it doesn't mean that he's worse than me or better than me. It just says, because he has no checklist of any kind, guess what happens? You get one of these, you have to take it at its word. You get photographs in part of reports, and he says it's fine, and you get these kind of photographs, what would you say? Hmm. Right? So you don't have to go there. You don't got time to go there. You need... So... This is another technical report, paper only, no pictures. And I said, can you give me some pictures? He said, no, we, need you. we just needed you to go over there and give us a price to paint. There's about 150 units, apartment units. And I went there, look at all the bowls that were coming off in my hands. And they said, just paint it. We have an engineer that already cleared it. You guys recognize these things? 
When's the last time you guys had your towers inspected? I guarantee you, this is a tower I did in Massachusetts, and the day I showed up, I closed it down because I pinged treads that men, young men, brand new men and women were training on. And look on the inside, you guys throw hay, and you guys kind of make all kinds of smoke. Look at the inside treads. Look at all the rust jacking happening in that bracket holding the platforms when these guys come out heaving and breathing and chucking, right? When was the last time? The National Firescape Association inspects fire towers for free, so you got a fire tower, give us a call, we'll inspect it for free. And not because we want to shut it down, because you, you don't want to have a dead fireman who hasn't even started training yet on the ground. So fire towers. So you guys pointing the fingers, my mom always says, when you point your finger, you always got three fingers pointing back at you, so be careful where you point. Yeah. So get the yeah. fire towers taken care of right away. Put out a bulletin. So they have all fire towers examined immediately. We'll do it for free. This is just rust. Rust everywhere. This is a, a, a hospital for veterans of World War II. Trash trucks, moving trucks, look what they do. They're 12 to 14 feet high, they, 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 they just smash everything. We get the, this is our ping pong test. We just ping with a two and a half pound hammer. Ping, 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 look at all these things. Firemen don't carry that on their belt when they're running up or down the fire escapes. That's why they've been told to get off. This is a city hall, right? Anybody see uh, the missing treads on the city hall? Here's your biggest issue, what's behind the brick? You believe that the fire escape on the front of the brick is better than the back side of the brick? Because why? Once it gets behind the brick, they rot. Look how solid the steel is there, but look back there because it stays moist. All the veneer, this is not structural, this, this, this is not veneer, this is not structural. The structural is behind the veneer. And you got that half inch, what happens when the roof is leaking? Between that half inch, guess what it eats? It eats this, it eats this, got it? So whenever we get to a fire safe connection, that's what you're mainly concerned about, right? We've already changed 95% of all the bolts on the outside, sistered and, and or replaced any deteriorated material, there's still an unknown inside this 12 to 18 inch thick wall. What do you do? You kick the dog that's sleeping or you leave it alone? You leave it alone and you get a new puppy. And what's the new puppy? A new puppy is a new epoxy bolt through the building to duplicate this connection. So let, this is a $500 repair or a $50 bolt installed. What do you think is cheaper for the client? Okay, so you let sleeping dogs lie, you put a new epoxy bolt into the building and if the building is no good when you try the epoxy bolt, then you have to go all the way through with a three-quarter shaft of threaded rod, and now you got a new plate on the inside. Now are you comfortable with other evidence of strength instead of a load test in your city? Because again, we're not shooting for load tests. That could cost five, eight, twelve thousand dollars every five years. They should use that money for bolts and paint, right? So the, it's what you don't see, but we've already have an answer for that. Do you wake it up or you leave it alone? What do you guys want to do? 500 bucks or 50 bucks? Wake it up. Just leave it alone, because you're going to find other problems with this building. So when the fire escape is tied in, leave it alone. It's called duplication. Just put in a new epoxy bolt or put in a new through bolt. Forget about that. Don't prove this out. This is a 100-year-old structure. We don't got time to take bricks apart and masons don't have time to put the bricks back in. You're gonna drill a three-quarter hole. So let sleeping dogs lie. It's what's behind and in the wall that's a concern because it stays wet. Where do they get the wetness from? Sometimes it's inside the building giving it wetness. Sometimes it's from the roof coming down that half-inch spacing because you have a leak in the roof that nobody hears about or sees. And sometimes it's from the outside as it spalls, it feeds water in what you can't see that's the problem. This is what through bolts look like going inside of a building. See that shaft? This is what I have to do if I want to verify. This is California. If I have to verify that angle, I have to destroy some things. I have to destroy its cement that's around it so I can see what it looks like and you know then clog it back up with some cement. Or can I just do about four to six inches over there? Can I drill a new same size hole, because this one I have to drill four or five consecutive holes by each other, themselves, by next to each other. So I can look down the hole and see what? By the way, this is Firescape Proctology. 
<laughs> what do you see? Boop! There's nothing. You can't see nothing. So if I take that same drill and I drill a hole four to, eight, four to six inches over there, and I, I put a epoxy bolt or a new through bolt, do you care that I left the original still intact? Because now I'm at 200%, or I'm at 150%, or I'm 130%. What you care is about who's, what's, what's the primary now? The primary now is the new connection. I got a brand new connection. Will you now accept other evidence of strength instead of a load test in your building? The answer should be yes. Okay? So this is what it looks like inside when you throw, you know, the, the, the little uh, camera inside there. This way, I can't see nothing. Okay? Lead. You guys know that no welding is allowed on any fire escape. So that's very important to note that the leads, because just to paint the fire escape now you need to have a renovator's license. So you can't weld on it. So the welding witch doctors have been eliminated. Why is that? Because as you start looking around for information, this is where I had to go get my information to say you can't weld on a fire escape. I had to go back down to the 1920s, 1930s, out of New York. This is how to build a fire escape. And all over this document it states that uh, you can weld in a shop, but then you need to bolt it at the site. So welding was never an acceptable means of fabricating fire escapes because there's too much movement in them. So do you have that in your law somewhere here? Probably not because it's all over the place. So I have to go get this. And did I get this because I just had time to search or was there another fatality issue that occurred? So I'm an expert witness in a lot of cases all over the country. The last case I uh, that one in New York City just a month or so ago, a girl visiting her friend in a four-story flat went to the roof deck using the fire escape because that's how everybody did it over there. They shouldn't go through the hallway up a ladder. She went through the fire escape on the way back out after a couple of beers. She fell, smashed into the first fire escape that her friend's in her friend's place. And she fell one more story down. She's a, she's a paraplegic now. And guess what they gave her? They awarded her for, for uh, that case because she's a quad, a, a paraplegic. $39 million. She would give it all back if she could just walk again, right? But what about the fact that the insurance company says, we're not going to pay it 